Um, tonight's speaker is Audrey Compton. She's a Moor Meadows member and has been for a very long time. Audrey has been um, a dairy farmer. She's been a ranger of managing nature reserves. And she and her husband John won the 2015 um, Grassland and Meadows Award for their work at Deer Park Farm. Audrey, I came to your meadow um, a few years ago and I was completely bowled over by the number of species and the abundance and it felt like a complete oasis in a green desert. And it made me feel actually quite nostalgic about how it must have been pre-war. And the work there is phenomenal. So if you get an opportunity to go to one of Audrey's open days, I highly recommend it. So enough ado, I will hand you over. Audrey just wants to say, Audrey's going to be speaking for about 40 minutes, and then there's going to be 10 minutes for questions. And then we're going to have delicious cake made by Audrey and wonderful star Gary Jackson, who is king of the cake makers, or queen, I should say. Um, and for about 20 minute break, and then I shall ring a bell, and then the last 20 minutes is Audrey will be talking about the fabulous um, platform management handbook that she's been working on. And she would like your help in providing case studies, if that's appropriate. Um, but we look forward to hearing more about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's lovely to see you all here tonight. Um, and before I even start at all, I would like my husband, John, to just stand up and say hello to you as well. Because... <laughs> Um, Deer Park Farm is very much a combined operation. Um, we started it in the year 2000. It's been the most exciting thing we've ever done. And we have just had so much fun doing it. So a lot of this is really about sharing it with you and hopefully inspiring you to do um, similar stuff. Um, it's been hard work as well. And we were discussing on the way here whether it's actually added years to our life or taken them away. But we sort of decided we didn't really care because it's just been definitely too good to miss. There is a third person who's really important to our farm, and that's our friend Tracy. Um, she and I used to milk cows together 30 years ago, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in the year about 2008, we had, had a little talk with Tracy. We wanted some cattle on the farm, and Tracy bought some calves, and from that has grown the small suckler herd, which balances the farm with our sheep. So I just wanted to say a thank you to Tracy because it would be very difficult for us to make it all work without her. And what's more, um, she does a lot of work in her on weekends and holidays and she gives us a holiday every year. So we have about seven, eight, nine, ten days off every year, which is an incredible thing for a farmer. So it's only about a 355 day year, which is pretty, pretty bloody good, I reckon. Yeah. Um, I have actually put a note there to say, please, if I don't recognize you, please forgive me. I do suffer from face blindness and I do find it particularly hard when there's a crowd of people to actually recognize people I even know quite well. So forgive me if, if I get things wrong. Okay, right. So here is one of our favorite pictures of, Dave, of Deer Park Farm taken by Steve Hussey from Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, and as you can see, it, it shows the farm with the green-winged orchids out, which is probably one of the best, not the only, one of the best times to see it. Okay, I won't press. I, 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 I can talk on. We, we can look at the pictures in a minute when, when it all recovers, which I know it will. Um, so I could just sort of start at the beginning and say that I was born in the South Downs. And anyone who's ever lived in the South Downs will know that the flowers there are just beyond description. So I lived at the bottom of the South Downs, and I had fragrant orchids and bee orchids. 
and just ordinary orchids and gentians and really incredible flowers to grow up with. Um, and that, that's had an effect on me. Must have done, mustn't it? And I just became addicted to all wildlife, but particularly to flowers. And when I was um, about 16, I started coming to Devon. And Devon adopted me, which was really kind of it. And I became a dairy farmer. I married a farmer's son. And we started off with about 30 cows. And then, almost as you had to then, um, there was a lot of pressure, 1968, 69, to produce more, produce more. And we very rapidly really went from 30 cows to 130 cows, at the same time um, bringing up our children and at the same time working much too hard. Do I try again or shall I just wait a minute, Nikki? Shall I put this down? Okay, that, that's great. Okay, right, so here are the fragrant orchids and there are Jack and Jill the windmills that I grew up just below. So yes, ne next one, Nikki, we'll, we'll do this verbally. Um, this is my old farm with a lot of Jersey cows. And if anyone knows Jersey cows, they're dead silly and they're not docile, they're naughty, but they're absolutely fantastic. Okay, um, when we got there, there were still barn owls, which we loved. And I'm ashamed to say that we didn't really understand why they suddenly went. We didn't really realize that it was our conversion, our slow conversion of old meadows into <coughs> intensive meadows. You know, we, we were quite intelligent. Why didn't we realize there were no voles anymore? But nobody did, and they vanished. So, ne next please. Yeah, just a picture of me many moons ago with my beloved cows. Um, just so that we get a handle on just how intensive life was then. So we had three cows to the hectare, and now at Deer Park Farm, when we're really looking after wildlife, we've got the equivalent of 0.7. That's a hell of a difference, four and a half times or something. The productivity was probably 20 times higher, and we literally produced enough milk every day for 5,000 people from 80 hectares. And at this moment now, at Deer Park Farm, we've got 40, so it was only twice as big. And what we never realized, and nobody realized then, was that it was all based on fossil fuels and bought in um, corn from other farms. And this has had an effect, and that's why you've all got a postcard on your seat, because I'm not only desperate to save meadows, but I'm desperate to save the whole world. And I'm going to beg you to help me in when we get to the end of this. It was a hard life. 1976, perhaps we're going to have repeats of that. And in 1976, we nearly went bankrupt. Um, had children of two and four at the time. It was incredibly hard. We had to make somebody redundant. And I just had to work all hours, and my children brought themselves up. And then in 1984, the government brought in quotas, which were needed, but they brought them in retrospectively. And you can't adjust your stocking um, when you're on a five-year cycle of getting a cow and calf and then getting her to productivity. It's very, very hard. And then we had what people called mad cow disease, another great stress. And perhaps not surprisingly, in 1990, our marriage failed. So we go on to the next slide very quickly. <laughs> we, we stayed friends, and so I milked my way through a three-year course at Seal Hain, which was absolutely brilliant and totally inspired me. Very sad it's not as it used to be, but it was fantastic. So I was really lucky, and the day after I finished my finals, I started working for Teambridge District Council as a ranger, first on a short contract and then as a senior ranger, and had a fantastic time. Um, we had lots and lots of different habitats, lots of different sorts of grasslands, as well as woodlands and many other habitats. Um, the left-hand one is already common, full of ant hills in that picture, 
fantastic limestone grassland. It's near Apple Pen. If you can ever go and visit it, do. It's, it's brilliant for invertebrates as well as um, flowering plants. And just a picture out of my archives of Hackney Marshes. I hope it is, Sean. I think it is. Um, just to show that we had lots of marshy grassland as well, which I learned a bit about as well, particularly from Sean. Okay. Worked with volunteers. Um, having come from a farm, I realized that probably I'd been really lonely for years. And working with volunteers and other rangers made it a really, really good job. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so lots of habitat management, lots of black and cutting and, and scrub bashing on Orly Common. So, um, John and I had been together for a few years by the time the year 2000 came and we thought we'd just like a couple of little fields that we could have a bit of fun with, with wildlife. And then Deer Park Farm came on the market and we walked around it. This, this is a view of it from the village actually. So the ridiculously steep stuff is ours over there and we went to see it in April and there was nothing much to show us that the meadows would be any good but we walked along the brook through the ancient woodland and we literally looked at each other and we said what is this farm worth and all we could come up with was a penny for a wood anemone and tuppence for a moshatel and we didn't have time to count them so in the end we just offered every penny we had and a lot that we didn't have, and we managed to persuade the owners not to put it in lots in auction, and we bought the lot. Okay. Um, at the time we bought it, I was actually walking from Sussex, my home, to Devon to celebrate my 50th birthday. Um, and <laughs> it was really bizarre because I didn't want a mobile phone, but my son said, Mum, you've got to take a mobile phone with you. And so under pressure I did, but in fact it was incredibly useful because John and I, as I walked, could discuss how much we could offer and where we could borrow the money from. So it was pretty important, that mobile phone. All right, okay, here's a map which I don't have a pointer for. Um, uh -huh. Okay, okay, let's try. Okay, yes, how exciting. Um, these green fields, bright green, were fields which the previous owners had planted up with um, cut flowers um, or these bits here, this bit and this bit with Christmas trees. Um, and these bits over here are hay fields, um, the levelest but highest fields on the farm. They've got about an inch and a half of soil in them, so not, not deeply fertile. Um, they'd had a barley crop taken off them. So basically, the yellow and the green fields are the most damaged fields on the farm, and they're the ones that we've had to work at a bit to try to restore. Um, in the middle, we have Devon Wildlife Trust's Middle Park Ruggedon Reserve, which used to be part of the farm, and in fact, the whole of this used to be part of this Ruggedon farm here, um, a beautiful farm with an old Devon long, longhouse. Um, so that's worth a lot more than all of our fields and our funny little um, house that we live in, but we actually wanted the fields. It's, it's not quite as flat as it looks. Um, <laughs> this, this field is, is so steep that we've allowed it to become woodland now, and it's actually a third bigger than it shows on a map, simply because of its steepness. And I remember the first time we walked up it, we had to actually hang on to the fence to be able to get to the top. Yeah, okay. Right, um, we bought the sheep that came with the farm and we moved in. We didn't have any stock through fields, which made it quite a challenge finding the sheep. And we had to put electric fences around our boundaries because some of the neighbours had got quite cross about what the sheep had been doing. I will say that the previous farmer had been very ill, his wife had died, so they had had horrendous problems. But it did mean that we took over a farm that was in a pretty bad state. Yeah, I, I'd been a, a, um, a milkmaid, if you like, and I had to very quickly learn how to turn into a shepherd. 
Okay, that's a sort of aerial view. Um, we're very lucky. We've got big buildings for the size of the farm, and that's been very important because it does allow us to bring our animals in during the winter months. And you can see that John very quickly put some tunnels up so that we could grow lots of fruit and vegetables and be fairly self-sufficient. So, yes, it, it was quite interesting with both of us having full-time jobs and it was genuinely difficult finding the sheep because they could be in one of, any one of six fields. Um, but I usually found them and they were usually in our fields, not somebody else's. And it was incredibly exciting the first year when we suddenly realised that the farm had exceptional wildlife, which we hadn't really expected. We renegotiated our Dartmoor environmentally sensitive area scheme so that we could get lots of grant money to put fences up and lay hedges. And we made restoration plans and we worked hard. Just after we moved in, foot and mouth started and literally my hair still stand up on end looking at that picture. It's only a picture I found but it was such a horrible, horrible, horrible time. And because of the slaughter that was going on around us, we actually decided not to buy any suckler cows which had been our original plan. And so we carried on just with sheep for the first seven years. This here, the, these are Christmas trees. So it's showing those fields which were covered in Christmas trees. And before the first Christmas, we had them out. And we sold what we could, and we burnt all the wiggly waggly ones. And this was obviously one of the fields that had been planted up with daffodils. And it still looks pretty daffodilly in the spring. But to our amazement, with fairly gentle management, it now has about 65 different species growing in it, as well as the daffodils, which is great. Just wanted to look at the other habitats. The brook is really important part of the farm, and it actually goes along our boundary for almost, well, about a mile. It's a fantastic little brook. It goes into the team just below the farm, and we've got otters and all sorts of wonderful wildlife there which use it as a corridor. Um, whoops. Oh. It's all right. No, don't worry. Oh. The, other, the other picture is just, just a typical hedge, and it's not a particularly good picture. But we do have three miles of them, and John has personally laid a hell of a lot of that and has done an incredible amount of fencing as well. We, we now get neighbours in to help with the fencing, but John is still the star hedge layer. Okay. We had just one pond when we came, and now we've got five. John found that he could dig them out quite easily with the four-end loader on the loader tractor. So we've got some nice small ponds which suit all sorts of different wildlife. And I really, really wanted to say that tracks are brilliant. We do tend to ignore tracks and even yards, farmyards. But you know, if you do a species list along a track or around the farmyard, it usually comes 75 to 85 species, which is much better than most meadows. Much, 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 much better than most meadows. So do, do value your tracks and look after them and even use them as sources of seed for your fields. Okay. Next one. Next one. <laughs> um, the restoration that was needed um, was partly our steepest fields, which you'd have thought had been bothered the least, had 14 years previously been sprayed with azulox to try and kill the bracken. Well, azulox isn't very um, damaging to other species except for only ferns and docks. So that didn't do a hell of a lot of damage in itself, but the little bit of superphosphate that was spread with it did do damage and we feel now many years later that it did most damage to the fungus on the grassland um, and that's quite interesting because some of the books say that it doesn't but we know that the fields that that helicopter couldn't access and that is the helicopter um, the fields that it couldn't access have had good fungi right from the day we arrived at the farm 
but the fields that it did spread on have very, very slowly recovered with time. Okay, I think I've probably dealt with that, yeah? Oh yes, just a little bit of fertiliser that was shoved on with the auctioneer's blessing to make the fields look a bit green because they'd sell better. And that took about 10 years to actually lose its effect as well. Okay, reintroducing meadow species. Um, I'd feel a bit of a fraud sometimes because we've got a, field, a farm with 24 fields and many of them are species rich. And that does mean that quite a lot of the fields have either almost regenerated themselves with the right sort of gentle management because they have seed banks and when you get a bit of poaching, which is often a good thing, um, then seeds in that seed bank can germinate and species can come back. And also, animals do hold seeds in their guts and when you move them from one field to the other, just in the normal way of they finish this field, they go to the next, they actually take live seeds which will germinate in their guts with them. And some species survive better than others, but I think it's been quite an important way in which our fields have restored. In the fields that have been ploughed, um, it's been a little bit harder and we have spread seeds by hand, usually just spreading them on bare ground or taking some green hay around, but we've probably done less of that than a lot of you have done. Okay, Nikki. Restoring grasslands is really hard because if they've been let go, they've nearly always got scrub in them. And it's very tempting to get that scrub out and get some meadow flowers in. But I honestly do feel that scrub is really, really important in its own right. And I think if you've got grasslands, try and find some space for it, whether it's letting your hedges grow up or letting your hedges grow out a bit and making sure you've got different species there. I think that's quite important. And we've also, right from the start, had this very, very chaotic sort of let a field seed one year in six. And of course, it just doesn't always happen because if you have drought, then your animal welfare has to actually override the system and it can get quite confusing. And I, I would say that we're often quite confused. Um, one thing that is quite annoying is satisfying the basic payment scheme, which gives us about six and a half thousand a year. And it's really important because that's usually more than our profit. So it stops us from making a loss. Um, but I don't know if anyone else in the audience has been bullied by the RPA about where their scrub is. We most certainly have. And scrub, which is really good for wildlife, we've sometimes had to take out against our better judgment. Okay. Right, it's quite a nice view of the farm. It's quite an old picture. It shows some of the old sheep we took over when we came, which were Suffolk's, and some of the shorter-eared ones, which are white-faced Dartmoor crosses. So we, we still crossed our sheep because they were hefted, and they knew the farm, and they had been born with this mineral balance that there is on the farm. We didn't want to buy in pedigree, this is or that. So we just bred them over to what we wanted. Um, and we've ended up with white-faced Dartmoors crossed with a, a thrin, which is a, a North Welsh, very hardy sheep. It's a tough old farm. It's north-facing on every field, north, northeast, northwest. And you've got to be tough to live here. Um, th that's one of our apprentice shepherds, that's Lola, one of our granddaughters, helping with the sheep. And that, sorry, <laughs> sorry, um, yeah, looking across to one of the steeper fields. Yeah, can you see cattle just at the top of that steep field? Some of you would have been in that one um, when we've had insect days with John Walters. Um, so that's one of our most floristic ones that you will see later. Okay, thank you. So. These are the suckler herd, um, based on Holstein Cross Frisian, Holstein Cross Hereford cattle, and then put to Belgian Blue or Simmental or whatever. Um, 
This is Tracy's enterprise. We haven't said they've got to be rare breeds. And I don't think it matters too much as long as they are born on the farm and have learned from the start that they're expected to eat rough old stuff. So that's the important thing. OK. We bought two Exmoors when we moved in <clears throat> because we were understocked and they cost £100 each. And we thought, yeah, Exmoors are meant to be good. And they've been brilliant. They're still here now, so they're in their 20s. They will live on anything. Um, they do eat bracken, even though it's meant to kill them. Um, we, to be honest, as long as there is something apart from the bracken for them to eat, we leave it to their own good sense, which is considerably better than our own. Um, quite interesting, just the right-hand picture, and that's an incredibly, ridiculously steep field, actually. It doesn't look it. But that little flattish bit at the top has become over-neutrified by the sheep going and sitting there every night. Um, so that's why we've got docks and weeds there. And later on, we'll be talking more about that sort of thing. And the fact that there are some things it might not be worth fighting. So some places where the weeds are not what you want, you might actually just have to live with it and concentrate on the areas which are easier to change. OK. Right, um, when we moved into the farm, because it had been stocked very lightly, even more lightly than we now stock it, um, because of the illness that the farmer and his wife had had, we had bracken higher than my head. In the first year, I can remember walking through the bracken trying to find the sheep and bumping into a, a fallow baby, a fallow fawn. Um, I couldn't see it, it couldn't see me. We were both equally terrified, I think. Um, John did a lot, has done over the years a lot of cutting, and the bracken is now quite different. We now have smaller amounts of wispy bracken, and I don't think we want to get rid of it completely. I think bracken is important for many other things, and it's been a little bit demonised. Um, you don't want it six foot high, definitely, but I think that if you can keep it under control, and make room for other flowering plants around it, you'll find that it has its own special habitats and it has its own fungi. And in fact, the very steep brackeny fields are the ones that have millions of primroses and dog violets and other spring flowers. So I think it almost has a purpose as a sort of strange hazel coppice that they can grow under. In other fields, brambles or creeping thistles have been a greater problem. Um, once again, John with his four-wheel drive and atop a very ordinary setup, 45 horsepower Sammy tractor, um, has done a fantastic job at keeping these under control. What I do try to make sure is that I never watch him because it is absolutely terrifying, but he seems to enjoy it, so what, what can I say? Um, all I can say is on the very steepest hills, I use a brush cutter where, where I don't want him to go at all. Okay. So haymaking is a problem to a lot of us, and we'll go into it a bit more after refreshments. Um, on our farm, the contractor comes in and cuts the hay in a couple of hours, and then we turn it for a few days, and when it's ready to bale, the contractor comes back with a ridiculously large baler and bales it. That's what we do. When we arrived at the farm, several of the fields, particularly those yellow fields that had that um, one crop of, of barley off them, had fences. And the first thing we did, John being a Devon Hedge Group person, we said, yeah, we're going to put, put hedges there. But then John, who has a lot more wisdom than me about aspect and things, realized that if we put hedges there, then the very steep fields sloping down below them would actually get no sun at all, ever. And that could really change the species that were growing in those steep fields below. And so we still have a, a fence there. But to my delight, in the first autumn that we were there, I found that migrant birds use it. So 
In September, we get spotted flycatchers, red starts, wind chat, wheat ear, um, as well as um, swallows, I was going to say, and Amazons, and I didn't really mean that, swallows and martins. And they actually just sit on the fence. And if we leave this uh, broad, sort of two and a half metre wide, uncut patch alongside the fence, then that's a great place for the invertebrates to go, and it's a great place for the birds to be able to have a rest on the fence and pop down and eat them. And also, um, more recently, we've had a Mohican, which is Donna's great idea. Um, so sideboards and a Mohican. And the Mohican is because contractors find it really, 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 really difficult to start in the middle and cut outwards. Now, there's good practical reasons for that. But in fact, in the Outer Hebrides, um, where farmers have been paid to do that to save um, to save corn, corn crakes. Um, it's worked really well. But when I've talked about it to our, our contractor, he's looked at me as if I'm from another planet. So we've left the bit in the middle. <coughs> Fencing and hedge laying, as I say, this is John's thing. Approximately a 20-year rotation. Um, we've got quite a few mature trees, but John always leaves a few more young trees. And especially now that we're going to be losing probably a lot of our ash, we're particularly leaving field maples and oaks and other species. We get lots of firewood. It does all of our cooking and heating and stuff. And later, when John's finished, it can be fenced really well and the spring flowers just pop up. We've had lots of walks right from the start. I think I did my first farm walks in about 1970 before I even had children. So I've always enjoyed having farms and schools come. And some of you will recognize yourselves there. So we do still have lots of walks. This is one beside the brook on the left. And the other one is one with John Walters in Folly Field, which you could see from a distance a little bit earlier. So we learn so much. And because we don't get out a lot, it's really nice that people come to us and brighten up our lives and give us new dimensions. And we just, we just get so much out of them. So that's brilliant. It's part of our life. Just thought I'd do a quick wild drive through the year. I don't know if anyone's looking at the clock to know how I'm getting on. Um, <coughs> shout at me if I've got to speed up, Donna. Uh, we've got fantastic ancient woodland indicators along the brook and through most of our woodlands, um, including lovely things like toothwort, which is a parasite on hazel and elm, and which we call romantically dirty dentures. Um, and it just pops up like magic at more or less from now onwards, and it just depends on the year when it chooses to come up. But yeah, lots of lovely things. Just because I don't take many good pictures, and I was quite proud of that grass snake, and I do rather love them. So that's, that's the sort of thing you get around the edges, and this lovely range of flowers, which is different for each field. So we're very lucky to, at the bottom of the, field, of the farm, going down to the brook, to have some literally calm measures which aren't very common in our area. And most of our very steep fields are more neutral grasslands. But some of them don't do that, don't know that. They haven't read the books, and that some of them think they're calcareous, which makes it even more exciting. Yeah. Just, just a, a, a collage, quickly. Um, rest harrow at the top, because I love rest harrow. And I just like the idea of somebody just stopping doing their harrowing and having a break. Meadowsweet, which I also love, but which has got quite bossy and is one of, the, um, one of the species we're having to manage a bit. And heath spotted orchid, just because you may get millions of them on your farm, but that's an orchid that we only ever get about three a year of. Um, so that, that's, that's our, our pin-up girl, if you like. I always think they look a bit like those frilly knickers that um, used to be worn at Wim Wimbledon. Um, in, in the old days, before people wore God knows what. Yeah, OK. Tufted hairgrass is one of the Colmy um, species, which I really like. But it, 
is a difficult thing. You've got to control it. Sheep can't eat it at all. It would cut their mouths. It's incredibly sharp and rough. Um, so we do have to keep it cut. We have to top it to stop it from getting too bossy. Common milk worked, which isn't common anymore. It's less common, I think, than um, the chalk milk worked. And the autumn ladies' tresses, which we haven't seen for quite a few years, and we only see if conditions are just right in the summer. Um, we hope it will come back one day. Okay. Yeah, some of my really rubbish um, bird pictures, but I had to shove them in anyway. The right-hand one isn't mine. It's actually our friend Fraser's, who puts stealth cameras around the farm and delights us with what goes on when we're in bed. Um, I don't think we were in bed with this when this one was taken, but a lot of them are after dark pictures. At the top are stock doves, which I, I particularly like, and I think we tend to forget about. And I'm always delighted that they visit our farm every day through the breeding season. And that very blurry picture is a female soul bunting, which we were very chuffed to find came back to us last year after 25 years having gone missing. And the reason they went missing was because the combine harvesters got so big that they couldn't get up our lanes. And so all the farms in our little um, ecosystem had to give up growing their occasional field of corn. They had to buy in straw, and the soil buntings and the yellow hammers lost their stubble for the winter. And the only reason we've got them back is because we've been buying millet and rapeseed, and they love it. And we're feeding it on a ridiculously big bird table. We don't do anything by halves. John made one about this big. And they, they come, it's, it's only a few feet from the house. So it's surprising we get any work done because we, we're often enjoying watching the bullfinches and the, and the soul buntings there. Okay. Another of Fraser's stealth camera pictures. We've got hundreds of them, and I just had to choose a couple. So this was just a roadkill and he pegged it out and got this dramatic picture of two buzzards having a fight over it. Okay, um, some summer invertebrates. So obviously the, su the, the invertebrates become more um, numerous as the year goes on. And one that we particularly like is the wasp spider here. And this is the only spider that I've ever held in my hand and felt the weight of it. It's like having a small marble in your hand. And so I get very excited about these things. But it, it, it's beautiful and it has a fantastic web. But it will only grow in places which are probably undergrazed. Um, so probably the balance isn't the best for your wildflower species, but it is best for the wasp spider. And so I suppose our theory is that we can undergraze some fields each year and hopefully keep the wasp spiders who float around when they're much smaller and just arrive. Um, and perhaps we don't get too precious about having the same management every year. The management is often quite different from year to year. And I just put in the Mother Shipton moth because I think it's, it's rather nice. And you can see Mother Shipton with her big nose there. So it's a lovely day flying moth. Okay. The great green bush crickets. I had to enlarge this a bit. Um, and you'll know that they are sort of four and a half inches long or something ridiculous. And the female with her oviposter is even longer. So they're just good value and everybody loves coming in August and finding them. And I felt that flea blain is an underappreciated flower. It grows really well in our more acid marshy colmy um, grasslands and it's just an incredible um, nectar and pollen flower and we get wonderful butterflies on them. Okay. A couple of pictures from John Walters who's been an enormous help to us. He's done a survey for us and he's also come um, every year for four or five years doing our annual insect day when we have a morning and an afternoon session and pack as many people through the, as, ca as we can so that as many people as possible get a chance to actually see John and work with him and hear what he has to say because he's, he's brilliant. So yeah, a bee mimic hoverfly, I'm not even really going to go to the arctophyll a bit. 
and the scarce violet door beetle. The violet door beetle is especially important for us to consider because it's a dung beetle and dung is incredibly important. Um, so we only get them because our cattle have fantastic dung with lots of stuff in it which hasn't been killed off by too much medication. Okay. Autumn. I get even excited during autumn. Um, these are butter wax caps on the left. Oops, I shouldn't have done that, should I? That was me. That was me. Sorry, Nikki. Whoop. <laughs> okay. Uh, sh shall I see if it will work for a minute? Yeah, we'll try. And if it all stops, then I'll just cry. Um, the, these are butter wax caps. They are tiny wax caps. And that is probably a square meter. Um, and if any of you who've come to the farm in the autumn to see the wax caps will realize that there are thousands of them. And it's really exciting. And it's as if the fields have been strewn with jewels. These are massive wax caps. They're as big as my hand. And they're crimson ones, relatively rare. And they just pop up in the same place almost every year, but not last year, when not 2018 when the drought obviously upset them. OK, let's see if that, yes. So um, lemon wax caps, golden spindles, and ballerinas. And the ballerinas always excite us and excite everybody else as well. They were a BAP species. And when people really looked, they found that actually there were more than was thought, which is, which is great, because they're, they're good fun. This is. The only thing that really did well this year was our bluets. I don't know if any of you have eaten bluets. These are wood bluets. Um, they're incredible, beautiful purple uh, fungi, and they're quite big, big as my fist. And we had four circles, almost perfect circles, with about 100 in each, and quite a few partial circles as well. So we just thought they were quite exciting. And that's just your average bus basket full of wax caps and other strange things on the side. So there's a whole community of grass and fungi which are known by nerds as chegs. And I'm not even going to go there, because otherwise you'd all fall asleep. So um, chegs are great fun. And if you want to, come in the autumn and we'll talk cheg. Now, this looks like a flat field with a lot of people leaning forward. But in, in fact, th this, is, this was um, four weeks ago yeah. when Devon Wildlife Trust volunteers and the Greater Horseshoe Bat Project got together for about the fourth year running, I think, to lay one of our hedges. And this is a picture of about 28 people hedge laying together, which I think is fantastic. I don't do it. I just bring tea and coffee and hot chocolate and things. But I, I think it's really inspiring when you can get people learning skills and enjoying wildlife together. So that's brilliant. And the picture on the right was in March. I had to put a snow picture in because we don't get much of it. And this is three of our grandchildren just having a really good time. OK. Right, we're drawing to a close. The habitats around the farm are really, really important. We're not an island. We can't be an island. We can't stop climate change. We can fight it, but we can't stop it. We can't stop atmospheric pollution, which is the effect, has the effect of fertilizing our fields. But we can do our best. And with the land around us, then our farm can make a much stronger, more resilient ecosystem. And this is the view from one of our fields, and it shows that a lot of the fields towards Trusham have been more or less abandoned. And I think this is a great help to us. We call it a sort of mini NEP. Um, it's rewilded, and this is the marshland that you can't quite see at the bottom of that. And most of the farms around us are fairly um, non-intensive. They're not organic. They're think probably that mostly they think we're totally mad because wildlife comes first on our farm but still they are part of the ecosystem and because there's so many hedgerows um, we are quite a joined up area 
So that's good. So what's the point of us looking after our wild flower meadows? And this is when I get a little bit emotional. Um, they are crucial to the future of our planet because there's so many species in them. And we need a lot more meadows and we need to join them up better. They're wonderful carbon banks because they're not ploughed up. They're beautiful and they make us happy. But I just have to say, there is no point us looking after these wonderful meadows if we don't actually look after the whole world. And I do get passionate about this because we have grandchildren, we have young people who don't deserve what's happening. And every one of us has got to look at our carbon footprint, look at it properly, go online, work out what it is, work out what we think it ought to be, and then adjust our lives accordingly. And we were just talking with other people in the audience who were saying that they knew neighbours who had family in Australia and family in America. They live a very, very simple life because by doing that, they can then fly over and see their families. And I think that's admirable because families matter so much. So we can all do a lot. It's no good being a Tesco and saying every little helps. Every little does help, but we've got to do lots of littles. If, we've got, if we're going to beat this in the 12 years that we're being given, which I suspect is none too long, then we've all got to do a lot. So that's the end of the first part, folks. <laughs>